Matthew chapter 3, we will be in verses 13 through 17. It was John Bunyan who said this, Thy righteousness is in heaven. Thy righteousness is in heaven. These were his words that were impressed upon him while he was walking. You know who John Bunyan is. He is an English writer, preacher. He wrote the book Pilgrim's Progress, if you haven't read it. Wonderful little book. He was walking in the fields one day, and the Lord impressed this. Let me read a part of that writing. He says, one day as I was passing into the field, this sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. And methought withal, I saw with the eyes of my soul Jesus Christ at God's right hand. There, I say, was my righteousness. What an awesome thing to, to, to be able to have that type of relationship with God that you could see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father and say, there's my righteousness right now. That is my righteousness. That is my everything. It's not me. It's not anyone else. It's Jesus Christ who sits upon the throne. So today's theme is imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. Some of you might not know what that is, but you'll learn it today with great detail. And you'll rejoice in the fact that we have Christ's righteousness and not our own filthy righteousness. For without Christ's righteousness, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. So last week we left off at verse 11, basically uh, giving us uh, the situation that was happening with Jesus and John. Jesus, or John said, he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So, so John uh, pretty much mentioning Jesus' baptism being of the Holy Spirit and fire, which is much greater than his baptism, which was repentance and water. And so he was mightier, John, again, taking that position of less than even a servant, that he was not worthy to even put the sandals of Jesus on his own feet. And so we come to verse 13 in our text today. Let's read it through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Then Jesus, when he had been baptized, came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and a lightning upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well pleased. Did you know that Jesus and John were related. Some suggest, tradition has stated, that they possibly could have been cousins. We know that the angel Gabriel had pronounced to Mary that Elizabeth, in her whole old age, had conceived a son. We find that in Luke chapter 1, verse 36. Now, the original Greek does not tell us exactly how they were related, but they were related in some way and possibly cousins. Not only was Jesus and John the Baptist related, but we also know that in Mark, he talks about James and John, who were Salome's uh, children, were also related. They were cousins of Jesus. Uh, I love that because it means that it's all about family and how God reaches family, how God will reach down and save an individual, and that individual will get so excited that he will then spread the news, and it will just go through the family immediately. I know that he did that with Jesus. You know, here's Jesus pronounced as the Messiah and then John the Baptist and then now John and then James. And then we know Peter and Andrew and it just seemed like they were all related. And so it is a family business, isn't it? I've heard people sometimes say, oh, that church is just all about their family. Well, yeah, it is about their family. It's about all our family and the families that join the families and so forth. I know that when I got saved, Immediately my wife was saved, and then my children were saved, and then my mother was saved, and then my sisters were saved, both sisters, and we're still working on my, my brother because it's about family, and it should always be about family. And God's chosen you 
to reach your family, to be a light and to share Jesus Christ with them and his righteousness. Now, Mary and Elizabeth <coughs> were together for about three months just before the birth of, of Jesus and John. And it seems from the text that, that John probably may not have known that Jesus was the Messiah. And so we're really not sure. It doesn't say it clearly, but it could be that he knew, but possibly not. And it makes sense that he did not or vaguely because they lived such a distance away and you just didn't travel like we do travel today. And so they probably had not seen each other for quite a while. The place that Jesus was baptized in the lower Jordan there, near a spot where the waters were divided uh, for Joshua and Israel in the entrance of Canaan. And that gives us a picture, as I'm laying this foundation for you, it gives us a picture of a, a new anointing. Uh, John is setting up something different, something new. Uh, it's the gospel. It's the good news. Uh, the old system, the old way, the law isn't working. Uh, the law is only condemning. Uh, people are realizing that uh, they can't keep the law. Uh, and so they're failing. And so how can they maintain a righteousness before God? They just can't do it. I don't know if you've found that out in your life, trying to be good before God, trying to do the best you can before God, and you find you fail a lot. I know I do. I fail a lot. I, I, I try really hard and I even lift myself up and then I really go at it like a bulldozer, you know, and thinking I'm going to do it this time and then I like falling into a hole and there's a bulldozer stuck again and trying to get back out, you know. I don't know if you find that out. It just doesn't work. The old system does not work. There's a new system coming, a new beginning in a, in a sense, possessing the promises of God that Joshua had from the Lord and from Abraham and from David and so forth to us, and that is of the Messiah. And so we see John here baptizing the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and get into today's text, starting at verse 13. And by the way, I'm excited about this because it's amazing that God would impute his righteousness to us. And so this should excite you, knowing who you are, and I knowing who you are, <laughs> knowing who I am. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Now, a couple of interesting words here that, that kind of <clears throat> explained a little more than just reading the text within the Greek. The word came there and to are interesting words. The word came there means appeared, to present. So Jesus came to present himself from Galilee to a preposition of direction towards or forward, it seems that what he's saying is there is a purpose taking place here, that God has a purpose for Jesus coming. It wasn't like Jesus was, you know, living his life out, and he's hearing about John the Baptist, and he starts thinking, hmm, I wonder if I should go down there and see what's going on. It, it wasn't that type of thing. It wasn't like, well, everyone's going, why don't I go? Let's just go see what's taking place over there. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Maybe next week, maybe maybe another time. No, there's purpose here. And because of purpose, Jesus goes down there to fulfill that purpose, and we'll see that in a minute. God does things for a purpose. Does all things for a purpose. We use the word, here, here's one of those words that, that we have been raised by, and that is luck. How many use the word luck? I hear it all the time, luck. There is no such thing as chance, luck. Things don't happen by chance. They happen by God. God has a purpose for things happening in our lives. It wasn't luck. It wasn't luck. You're not lucky. You're not unlucky. You know, you're not a lucky fellow. You're not a lucky gal. It's God has a purpose for your life. Get rid of that word. I don't use that word anymore. I try to find other words. It's hard to replace it. Sometimes you'll catch yourself and say, that was lucky. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. That was a blessing. You know, th that was with purpose. You know, you find another, <laughs> you find another, another reason, you know, another word there than, than luck. You know, luck has nothing to do with it. So God has you right where you're at for a purpose, for a reason. He's working something out in your life and their lives and those around you with a purpose and reason. And so you exist with purpose. And we see that in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. He's created us with a purpose and a hope. And so you have purpose. Uh, you're where you're at because Jesus has you there. Yeah, but I don't like it. That's okay. <laughs> God still has you there and he's working things out in your life and he's doing it because you're worth it. He doesn't just create you. 
uh, to just exist and hopefully, there you go, hopefully things work out, see you later. You know, no, God is actively involved in your life with purpose. So Jesus comes down from the north to the Jordan River some 60 to 70 miles on purpose to this baptism. The fame of John was growing. It was reaching Galilee, and Jesus was waiting for this hour to take place. Then he went. Now, he traveled the terrain just to be baptized by John. Now, you have to ask yourself this question. Why? What was the purpose for Jesus to be baptized by John? Why would he have to travel all of those miles to get to John and at that immediate time. As I was reading some commentaries, there were some interesting uh, suggestions that I thought were pretty much outlandish and false. Heresy, I would even say. Uh, One person uh, said that uh, it could be that uh, he was not aware of his sin, so he came in repentance just in case. (laughs) That was interesting. Another one said that Jesus came in repentance uh, to find forgiveness for his sins. Another outlandish one. Those are actually false. That's not why he came. If you were just to read your Bible, instead of guessing games, instead of listening to someone else and what they have to say, you'll know the answer. Drop down to verse 15, he tells you right there to fulfill all righteousness. That is the reason that he came, with purpose. Not because he was a sinner, not because he had faults, not because in case I'm mis understanding something in my life and so just in case I want to go get baptized you know no he has a reason for doing it and the reason is you and me to fulfill all righteousness so that we can approach God in his righteousness so Jesus comes to Galilee to John to be baptized by him verse 14 and John tries to prevent him saying I need to be baptized by you and are you coming to me now here's the heart of John again Remember last week how he said, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. You know, I'm lower than a, than a servant who would carry the sandals of their masters. I can't even wear those sandals. Who am I to dare even untie them for you? And now he's preventing Jesus. And in the Greek, that is an imperfect, meaning trying to prevent Jesus. So it's almost like he saw Jesus coming. He runs up and he says, um, what, what are you doing? And Jesus is trying to walk into the water. He's like, well, hang on. Why are you here? What's going on? He keeps moving in front of Jesus, you know, trying to prevent him from from being baptized. And then he says, I need to be baptized by you. So his his last resource was, wait a minute, stop. Look, look, I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. Who am I to baptize you? And that word I, again, is emphatic in the Greek. In other words, he's focused on himself, his flesh, his nature, who he is personally, Uh, Not looking at anyone else and saying, I, I am such a wretch. You should be baptizing me and not me baptizing you. So he felt that it was out of order for him to baptize one so anointed, one so called of God with purpose, that it would be better for him to baptize John than him. So Jesus came to you. Now, if Jesus came to you and asked you to baptize him, you'd probably feel the same way, right? Would you say, hey, would you baptize me? Like, <clears throat> wait a minute, you should baptize me. I'm not going to baptize you. In fact, Jesus, why don't you baptize me with the Holy Spirit and with fire? Because that's what you came to do. And I think that's probably what John might have been saying here. Look, my baptism is just water and repentance, but your baptism is of the Holy Spirit and fire. I need the Holy Spirit. I need the fire. I need the power. I need the strength. I don't have any on my own. And so I need you to baptize me. You know, we need the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives for whatever we do with our hands. Without it, we're powerless. And so we need God's Holy Spirit to come in us to give us the ability to work for Him and to glorify Him. Anything other than that is nothing. And it won't last. If it's not anointed of God, if God hasn't called it to be, and if there's no purpose, it won't happen. Because God has purpose for our lives. You know, <clears throat> we try different things. We go different ways. And we're hoping to find God's purpose. And, and so we take steps of faith. And a lot of times we don't 
find that purpose there, do we? It's kind of like, like your kids, you know, they're growing up, and I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I'm going to be this. They end up going to college, and they, ta- they take uh, this, th- this career choice, and then by the end, they're done. They've got another career choice, you know, because they just don't know what they want to do. Well, it's like that spiritually with us. I know people who have known the Lord for 10, 15 years, and they're still asking, what has God called me to do? Why does he have me here? And so we're trying different things. We, we take a step of faith in this ministry. Okay, that didn't work out. Let me take another step over here. Okay, that didn't work out. So what are you calling me to do, Lord? Give me my purpose. Well, whatever it is, God is going to give it to you. It doesn't mean that you're a failure. It just means you're finding your purpose, and God is leading you and, and really training you for that purpose ultimately in the end. There is no failures in God's kingdom. God doesn't raise up failures. He raises up winners, and all of you are winners in the eyes of God. He has a purpose for you, and you have your place in the body of Christ, and every part is, is perfect in the body of Christ. No, no part is not perfect in the body of Christ, and we should understand that. You know, if, if I'm playing basketball, and I'm a right-handed person, and I shoot the ball this way, you know, and it goes into the hoop, and wow, this is, this is great, wonderful, but my other arm doesn't go, that's not fair. How come I don't get a chance? You know, I like to shoot the ball, you know, it just feels weird shooting that way, you know. No, the, the right hand does it. The left hand does something else. It has another purpose, but it's a part of the body of Christ. There's a reason for it there. Just find your purpose. I don't know what my left hand is supposed to do, but <coughs> I <laughs> block, I guess, and right, <coughs> get out of the way and phew. <laughs> so <coughs> we need the Holy Spirit, and that's something that you pray for. And you ask God for on a, on a daily basis to infill you. So John asks, are you coming to me? But Jesus answered, verse 15, and said to him, permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. A couple of interesting things there. Highlight for us. That identifies them both as playing their part in God's unfolding purpose. Jesus says, it's important that us, it's us, you have to allow me to, so that I and you can fulfill the purpose here that I've intended it to. God has a purpose for us, and we're all a part of his plan, and we play an important part in his plan to fulfill all righteousness. That's the reason that Jesus was baptized, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And of course, then we see John's obedience, right? Because a servant is always obedient to his master. Obedience is important. Having the knowledge and knowing it to be true doesn't mean you're being obedient. Think about that for a second. Sometimes it feels like it. Well, I know that. But ask yourself, well, are you doing it? Well, no, I'm not. But I know that. But are you doing it? That's what's important. That's where the power comes in of the Holy Spirit. So John says, I'll allow him. Interesting that this phrase, permit it to be so, means allow it to be or let it happen. So the baptism was appropriate even for Jesus, who needed no personal purification from sin because he was pure and holy, the Lamb of God who take away the sins of the world, who had no sin whatsoever. If, if anything, he understood what sin was, the temptation, but he never gave in to it. Jesus said it was that all righteousness would be fulfilled. That's the reason that he needed to be baptized. Now, Matthew had already used the word fulfilled several times. And usually when he uses the word fulfilled, it was to fulfill the scripture, to fulfill what Isaiah the prophet said, to fulfill what was spoken. He always used it in that manner, and he'll use it again probably eight more times. When we come to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. What does he mean by that? How does he fulfill the law? His righteousness, by his righteousness. See, the law requires that you keep it. It's there for us to keep. But we find as human beings that we can't keep it because we have a flesh, a sinful nature. It's been, in a sense, imputed to us by Adam, we have take on that sinful nature. We have been born with that sinful nature. Talk about that in a second here. <clears throat> so 
Here he uses it in the terms of fulfilling all righteousness. Baptism is a type of the Lord's immersion into suffering, in burial, and in resurrection. That's what baptism is for Jesus. It talks about his suffering as he suffers in the world, but it also talks about his burial as he will be buried for three days and then resurrect, just like in the water. You're being forced into the water, you're in the water, and then you come out of the water. For us, baptism is about the flesh and crucifying that flesh and dying to the flesh and coming out a new person. That's what baptism is for us. Let's stop there for a second. Let's talk about that. Because we are basically made up of two things. Spirit and flesh. We have a soul, but spirit and flesh. The spirit is alive in us because we've asked Jesus Christ into our hearts. And so the spirit comes alive. It's born again, the Bible says. It's be- it becomes a new, we become new creatures in Christ Jesus because of the spirit. And the spirit now is at war with the flesh. The flesh is our body. This is a thing that hungers for things and thirsts. Uh, it lets me know when I'm hungry. How does it do that? Well, your stomach has a way of doing it, right? It starts to... And, and you can say, well, okay, shut up. You know, big deal. You're hungry. I know it. But after a while, it tells you, okay, well, wait till you feel this one. And you're like, oh, I'm really getting hungry now. It's like a pain there. I got to go eat. I mean, we're, we're, we're so hungry at times, we're willing to sell our birthright. Isn't that what Esau did to Jacob? I'm so hungry for a bowl of cereal, you know, I'll I'll sell it to you. Give me some food. That's how strong the flesh is. It is amazing. And we struggle with the flesh. Every one of us here struggles with the flesh. Maybe not in one particular thing. We all deal with different things. It could be food. You know, it it could be lust. It could be material things. Uh, It could be pride. It could be knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, the Bible says. Those are all fleshly things. It's what the body wants. It's what the body craves. And so we need to crucify that body. That's the struggle. That's the suffering that we have. And so we take that flesh, that body, and we force it into the water saying we're going to crucify it. We're going to kill it. We don't want to give in to it because there's a battle between the spirit and the flesh. Paul knew this. He knew that the things that he wanted to do, he couldn't do because the body just wouldn't let him. And the things that he didn't want to do, he found himself doing because the body just kept giving him those cravings. And at the end in Romans 8, he says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank be to God. It's through Jesus' righteousness. And so we, we take that flesh that we all live with, and by the way, that flesh is filthy. It's corrupt. It's evil. Now, the world will say, wait a minute, stop there. And I can remember being a little kid in school and them telling me, you're a good kid. Everyone's good. Everybody has good in them. Now, come on, let's be honest. How many have heard that? Only a few. How many believe? No, don't raise your hand. How many believe that? Because people believe that. They really believe that. And I can understand that because we want to hope that there's something good about us. And so that is a false, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Because by nature, our flesh is sinful. The spirit in us, though, is different than the flesh. The spirit is the one that hungers to be good and right before God. The spirit is the one that God reborns, you know, resurrects and is alive, brings it alive, brings it alive. So that now we have this war and we have to crucify the flesh. Our flesh is... And righteousness are like filthy rags, the Bible says, like filthy rags. What do you mean by that? Anything that we try to do without God, it's filthy rags, no matter what it is. Wait a minute. So if I'm doing something good over here for somebody, and and it's just because I'm a good person, well, if it's not with God or for the purpose of God, it's filthy rags. It's no good. Well, what's a filthy rag? Well, when you go to Isaiah and look at the word filthy rag in the Hebrew, it's talking about material rag that is used for women who have their monthly cycle. That's what our righteousness is like, a filthy rag that's been blood-stained. Boy, that's kind of (laughs) bad. I mean, I I don't know if I like that, but that's the truth. That's how God views our our own righteousness. 
And we walk around like, oh, look at how good I am. No, you're not good. I have a, a little toy poodle, snowball. We thought it was a teacup. <clears throat> we bought it here from, from the community, and they said it was a teacup. We got ripped off. <laughs> Turned out to be a toy poodle, so it's a lot bigger. But we love that little dog. Almost died of parvo. She got parvo, and the only thing that saved her life was the fact that she probably was a part of a litter that they barely fed them, and so she had to fight for her food. So it gave her this, this desire to eat fast because she wasn't going to get it if she didn't. And so she loved to eat, and so we would pour a lot of water in her food because she wouldn't just take the water. But as soon as we put food, <laughs> she just eat it up. So we poured the water, and you die um, because of dehydration with parvo. <clears throat> and so she made it through. And so she's like our, our little miracle puppy. But she'll go around the house, and, and sh you know how dogs like to just start biting at things and going in the trash and trying to dig stuff out? She'll do that. And, and she'll find stuff in the trash that's just garbage. And she'll grab it, and she'll run around like this, you know, and say, look what I got, ha, 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 you know. And she'll come and lay it before us like it's a gift or something. Like, well, I don't, that's trash. Go throw it away. I don't want your trash. You know, she's jumping around all excited, you know, her tail's waggling and looking at us, you know. And we're like, that's filthy. Stop it. And we'll even spank her on the butt. Don't go in the trash can like that. That's how God sees our righteousness. It's just trash. That's how God views our flesh. We're to take that flesh and we are to put it into the water. And we're to crucify it. We're to bury it. And then when we come out, we're to come out anew, resurrected in a new life. Battling against the flesh now on a daily basis. Oh, it's there. And we have to battle it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when the lust comes up, when things happen, we say, no, that's not for me. No, I want to live for God because there is something good in you, and that is God who dwells within you. That is what's good. And God made you for a purpose. <clears throat> that is biblical baptism for us. But Jesus, this baptism was different. This baptism was to fulfill all righteousness. What did Jesus fulfill? Righteousness. And so he imputed that righteousness to us. He gave that righteousness to you and me. Well, what does that mean, imputed righteousness? <clears throat> There's a thought called infused righteousness. How many have heard that, infused righteousness? Infused righteousness refers to Roman Catholicism. It's the doctrine of justification. And basically what it means is it's a process within the Catholicism system. In other words, Christ did it. He started it for you but now you have to maintain it. And, and so keeping the sacraments, keeping the traditions, you know, confessing your sins to a priest, saying so many prayers, that's the process within the Catholicism um, justification. For us Protestants, um, that's unbiblical. And again, if you just read your Bible, uh, you'll find the scriptures are very clear that it's imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness is a theological concept directly related to the doctrine of justification. And justification basically is being made right before God, okay? It would be like <clears throat> you standing before a court and you're guilty and a judge knows you're guilty and this is the sentence or the fine that you have to pay. Someone comes along and pays it and just says, well, you're justified and you can leave now. Just as though you've never done it before. You're, you're, you're gone, you're done, it's satisfied. And so with us, because of sin, Jesus has justified the results of sin in our lives. And so we are justified before God as though we've never sinned. Justification is that step in salvation in which God declares a believer righteous. Protestant theology has emphasized that this includes the imputation of Christ's righteousness, accrediting it to a believer's account. God credits Christ's righteousness to us. You are righteous because of Christ. He imputed it to you. Therefore, it means that upon the repentance and belief in Christ, individually and forensically declares you righteous. Forensically, basically, just basically, um, it, it, it's God having the authority to declare you righteous. If you're in an accident and you, you get hurt and you're laying there and you die, you know, they'll send the police to put the yellow ropes around you, you know, and draw the chalk line around you in whatever way you're laying. You know, and the guy will come over who's the official and he'll say, forensically, 
He's dead. <laughs> he's dead. There's nothing we can do. And so he's dead. So God declares us forensically righteous. That is amazing when you think about it. When you think about how sinful we are in our, our nature, in our very thoughts. I was listening to a guy, intelligent guy, and he was talking about how God was ministering to him about sin in his life and that he thought he was something because he had all this knowledge. And God kept reminding me, you're nothing. You're nothing without me. You know how someone will share with you uh, a situation that's going on in their life and they're really being sincere and just need you to listen and, and maybe even pray for them and agree with them. But immediately what happens sometimes with us is as soon as they start sharing, we, we think of a story too. And we're like, can't wait to tell you my story. You know, that type of thing. See, that's selfish. Instead of being willing to say, let me just listen to them. Let me be available to them. No, I got a story for you to tell. Then you can say, wow, that's pretty good. You know, that type of thing. Well, that's how this guy was. Well, God's really ministering to me. I'm, like, I'm nothing. And so we kept trying to say a few things about what was going on. No, no, just listen to me. Just listen to me. I got the knowledge. And he kept going on like, okay. Yeah, God is trying to minister to you that you, you need to remember you're nothing. You're nothing. We're nothing without the righteousness of God. And it's been imputed to the believers. Matthew 5.20, Jesus said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. Now that is interesting. He told the disciples, look, you think that the religious leaders are righteous. That's nothing. You have to surpass their righteousness in order to get to the kingdom of God. Well, how do you do that? You take Jesus' righteousness. He gives it to you, and that's how you become more righteous than the religious leaders. Paul understood that. You remember that Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees? I mean, he was a part of Gamaliel's group. He read all the books. They couldn't supply enough books for him. He was educated. He knew what he was doing. He had followed the law to the T. He was more righteous than any Pharisee around, and at the end, he realized it was nothing. It was all a pile of rubbish. Dung, he said. He considered it nothing compared to Christ. In fact, he, he came to a point where he realized, I am the chief of sinners. Here's an educated man. Here's a man who followed the law. Here's a man that, that had everything going for him. And yet he said, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm worse than the worst that are out there. Wow. And he saw his need for Jesus. Saw his need for Jesus. Since our Lord himself submitted to this baptism, so that he could give us his righteousness. How much more should we live in righteousness for him? Right? We shouldn't live in our sins. We shouldn't give in to our sins. We should live for God to please him because he gave us his righteousness. That is amazing grace. That is awesome. That I don't stand here before you in my own flesh, which is nothing, but I stand here before you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you sit there in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are children of God because of Jesus' righteousness. You're entering into the kingdom of God because of his righteousness. You have all the gifts before you because of his righteousness available to you. It has nothing to do with you at all. In fact, if it was just you, you have nothing. You have to come to the end of yourself before God can use you. Once you come to the end of yourself, then you come to God and God then begins to lift you up and he gets the glory. Now, Jesus did this as an example, didn't he? For us also. He left us that example. Peter said, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Jesus' baptism was also an example to us. We all have to get baptized. Jesus got baptized and even I had to get baptized and my wife too. That was in 1987. We were at someone's house, I don't remember, but yes, that's Richard right there, a young man. I forgot that you even were a part of our baptism. <clears throat> that was probably one of our greatest moments where both of us were baptized on the same day. I can't remember who was first, probably her. Hopefully it was her, and then me, if I was a gentleman. And I showed that picture to her, and it, you know, she remembers everything, all these thoughts. Oh, yeah, Richard there, and, you know, Donna was there, and all these names. I'm like, I can't remember who was there. I just remember being there and being baptized. 
because Jesus was baptized. We all should remember that if he was giving us that example that we too need to um, be baptized. And I don't know if you've been baptized or not. I'm going to give you an opportunity to get baptized. Not today, but this coming June we'll have a baptism and a great celebration where you can invite all your friends and family and just really celebrate dying to the old man, burying him, and resurrecting to a new man. A wonderful thing that takes place in the life of every believer because baptism is important. Now he said, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Verse 16, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and a lightning upon him. So Jesus is baptized by John and it says, behold, and again, that's that imperative, emphatic word. It was like immediately, boom, the clouds opened up and the Spirit of God descended upon him completely. Now, really quickly, this is not an anointing that Jesus needed to fulfill his role. This, this was more of an acknowledgement that Jesus was fulfilling his role by the Holy Spirit. Now, whether it was literally like a dove, you know, in the sense of form of a dove or a dove filled with the Spirit, who knows how it came down on him and it began to um, direct him. In other words, this was the way that God said, this is what you're called to do. These are your marching orders, and I am anointing you to do that as a symbol of my approval upon you as the Son of God. Because immediately after that, we see in verse 17, suddenly, again, there's that word again, behold, suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So a voice from heaven came and we see the Trinity here taking place, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time there, but it is important that we do believe in the Trinity. It is a part of our Christian faith and it is um, doctrine. In fact, I would probably go as far, and I know someone have, some have suggested maybe not, even if you don't have a full understanding of it, but you at least need to believe it in the Trinity. It's not polytheistic. We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God, but three persons. And how do we explain that? It's very difficult to explain it. We have examples of it like the egg. You have the shell and then the, the, um, the a white part of the egg and then the yolk of the egg. It's, it's three different compartments, I guess, and yet it's an egg. So an example, you have... Uh, uh, St. Patrick, you know, the shamrock. It, it, it's a shamrock, but it's got three little li little leaves there, or clovers that are that are there. And we have man. He's, he's body, uh, soul, and he's spirit, but yet he's a man. Another example of it. Me, I'm a father. I'm also a son, but I'm also a brother, and yet there's only one of me. Uh, you can look at water. There's it, it can be a gas, it can be a liquid, and it can even be solid. So again, it's H2O water, but yet it could be di three different things. Scientists tell us that at absolute zero, it is all three at one instance of time. I'd like to look into that. I'm not quite sure how that works, how it's all three. Whatever it is, how it works, we believe in the truth. gods besides them so he's been baptized the heavens were open unto him he saw the spirit descending upon him like a dove a voice from heaven comes out and screams this is my son in whom i am well pleased let's close all mankind fall short of the glory of god there is no one that is righteous no not one our righteousness are like filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6 is very clear. Before the throne of God, and so all are dead in their trespasses and sins. And as a result, will not come into God's light for fear of their deeds or their evil deeds will be revealed to him. John 3, 20. So all mankind is in this predicament because all are the offspring of Adam and Eve and we have original sin in our lives. And so because of that result, we're in need. Need of what? Jesus Christ. We're in need of his righteousness to be imputed to us. And if we confess him 
as our Savior and our Lord and believe that he died and was buried and resurrected, the Bible says we'll have eternal life if we believe. And if we confess it with our mouth, it's set in concrete. But you have to believe, and God gives that righteousness to you. He, he credits it to your account, and you become righteous to enter the kingdom of God. Isn't that good news? That's wonderful news. I was so excited. I was really excited. It reminded me when I first got saved, and, and God just showed me that, man, my flesh was evil. And at that moment, I lost all hope. I was like, I'm doomed. I'm going to hell. And I, I, was, I was already planning my, the rest of my life. I was going to have fun, party till, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to die and go to hell anyway, so I better enjoy myself before I do. And then all of a sudden the hope, but Jesus came and he took your place. And you can be forgiven, forgiven. God, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I thought. Forgiven? Yeah, forgiven. And his righteousness can be given to you. Really? And boy, when I believed that and accepted it and, and realized I was totally wicked, filthy, then God changed my life with power from the Holy Spirit. And that's what God wants for you, power. I know some of you are living in the flesh. That's why you're so miserable. That's why it's so hard. You hide it well, but God knows and you know he doesn't want you living like that. He wants you to live in victory. He wants you to live in love. You know it's miserable because <laughs> you've been doing it for a long time and you covered it up with things. The way you speak, the words you use, the things that you display at certain times, but just a cover. It's not working because you're not happy. There's no joy in your life. You're miserable, probably... 22 hours out of the day. But maybe when you're sleeping, you're fine. God doesn't want that for you, for anyone. He wants you to have joy and peace in your life, and it only comes by submitting yourself to Him, surrendering everything to Him, and saying, I'm just going to live for you, Lord, no matter the cost. That brings real peace. 